1 through 13. But it only goes to 10. I'll read you to 10. <laughs> Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. <clears throat> I urge you, Judea, and I urge Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. As for the things that you have learned and received and heard and noticed in me, do them, and the God of peace will be with you. Rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you've revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned for me but had no opportunity to show it. Not that I am referring to being in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I've learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I thought they were all there. They yeah. are. It's all good. It's all good. Well, today is our last sermon on the fruit of the spirits, and I had, like I told you in the very beginning, I had a different sermon series kind of slated out from my uh, year-long uh, retreat where I try to listen and put things in. And so it was interesting that on the Sunday that I kicked off this, the uh, scripture that day had something to do with fruitfulness and fruit of the Spirit and abiding in Christ. I use um, a U version, which is a Bible app, and it gives you like a daily scripture and a little bit of a devotion that goes with it. So today... The uh, YouVersion devotion is Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Anybody remember what that is by now? It's the fruit of the Spirit. I'm like, oh, okay. So it, it's nice when you feel like, okay, I, I maybe heard correctly this time. It doesn't always happen, but I'm thankful. So one of my favorite movies growing up was Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory, the Gene Wilder version. Uh, yeah. And as I was a young child, I dreamt of living in a factory where everything was made out of candy and you could eat it at any time. Probably wouldn't have been very good for you. But. Now, as an adult, though, I look back at that movie, that story, and I see that the characters represented what Christian tradition calls the seven deadly sins. Have you guys looked at it from that perspective before? So the seven deadly sins in Christian tradition are gluttony, pride, greed, <clears throat> sloth, lust, wrath, and envy. These sins are sometimes taken to an extreme with harsh consequences because of a lack of self-control. Augusta Gluck can't stop himself from drinking from the chocolate river and falls in. Veruca Salt wants what she wants when she wants it. Remember the song, don't care how, I want it now? right before she falls into that bad egg shoot. And Willy Wonka is a creative inventor with a terrible temper and manic mood swings. Sin happens when we neglect to use self-control. It's when we let our basic instincts and human desires take precedence over the will of God for our lives. Self-control is the final fruit of the spirit. We spent the last few weeks fleshing out Galatians 5, 22 and 23, which listed the virtues that should be evident in our lives if we are following Jesus. And I wonder if spirit-powered self-control is last because it is critically important for growing any of the other attributes that came ahead of it. And yet, 
to be honest, it's the last thing I really want to preach about today. And it was a really hard sermon to write. You just hear the words self-control or control yourself and defense mechanisms go up all over the place. Many of us have struggled to stop a bad habit or harmful behavior over and over again without success. So talking about self-control makes us feel guilty or like a failure. And we don't like feeling that way. At least I don't like feeling that way. A former college professor wrote a book about 30 years ago called The Way of Christian Living. And in one section, detailed his battle with smoking. He said that he tried to quit over and over again, but would lose control and go right back to it. John Timmerman writes this, quote, and believe me, I have tried every technique. I have a medical journal with full color pictures of diseased organs. I have a drawer crammed with motivational literature, stop smoking pills, nicotine, chewing gum, and other things. It's laughable, it's sad. Is it beyond my control? I'll keep fighting until I find out. I would like to tell a happy story here of how I was able to give it all up and praise the Lord, but I can't tell that story yet. The sad fact of fallen nature is that self-control is a ceaseless battle and we are not always victors. Perhaps we can't defeat the problem entirely, but we can fight to control. This one thing is certain. If I had not started, I wouldn't have this trouble stopping." End quote. Once we start something that we know isn't what will help us live our very best life for God, it is hard to stop. And if we're living with behaviors that are causing us harm physically, relationally, professionally, spiritually, we're not going to be able to stop them by ignoring them so that we don't feel guilty or bad about ourselves. The only way to fight them is to ask God's spirit to fight for you and fight within you to grow healthy self-control. The ability to make wise, healthy choices instead of impulsive ones. The ability to make decisions based on established goals. The ability to not act on a feeling before anticipating the consequences of that action. These are all partial explanations of self-control. Being able to control oneself in body, mind, and spirit by practicing spiritual disciplines in order to become who God has created us to be. Surrendering our will to the will of God so that we live with Christ's control as our self-control. Living in ways that reflect Jesus to others takes ongoing self-control with God's help. Harvard Business and other leadership development groups have used Abraham Lincoln as a study of someone who grew as a leader as he grew his self-control with God's help. And that control helped him to bridge a contentious time in our nation. As a younger man, Lincoln was impulsive, struggled with mood swings, and would tell someone off by writing a scathing letter to the newspaper using a fake name and he kept changing the fake names. And after almost going to a duel following one such letter because his true identity was found out by the person he was attacking, Lincoln began to evaluate other ways of communicating and trying to win the battle with words. When Lincoln was president, he still wrote scathing letters when he was angry with other leaders or with army contractors who were trying to rip off the government, but he then threw them away, or hid them in a drawer without sending them. During such a divisive time period, he knew that he had to work harder to bring people together and not alienate them with hateful words. There was a nation at stake. But he also knew that he needed to get those first emotional thoughts out so that he could practice self-control to find better options for winning the war. There were a lot of different facets to Lincoln, but over his lifetime, he worked hard to be a self-controlled man with God's help. And that helped him to be a good leader at a critical time. We all need to grow in self-control. 
It's what the keeps the virtues from becoming a negative force instead of a positive one in our lives. Because even good things out of control can be bad things. We have the Mississippi River running very near this town, which can be used to move goods up and down the river. It can be used as a resource for fishing, to help with restaurants, to have food to serve. It can be a place for families to relax and boat and have fun. But when it overflows with too much water, the results are tragic and disastrous, as y'all know too well. When the river is under control, it's good. When it's out of control, it's horrible. We all have areas in our lives that could be so good if things were in balance. But because self-control is so hard for us humans, there's pain and struggle and sometimes tragic consequences. In the beginning, God created a beautiful world for humans to take care of and enjoy and filled it with everything that they needed for good health and abundant life. God told Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply. And God said, don't eat from one tree in the garden. And they didn't do so well with that. We don't like to be told no or have boundaries set for us, do we? It's hard to have self-control when we feel like we are missing out on something or being deprived. Sex is something that churches don't talk about as much as they should because it has been taken to excess and perverted in our world. About 10% of the U.S. population self-identify as having an addiction to pornography, with men three times the rate of women. Relationships have been torn apart and lives have been destroyed because of a lack of self-control over one's sex drive. Sex was intended as a gift from God to provide intimacy among couples with a deep level of love and trust and vulnerability. But we've turned that gift into something that we're afraid to talk about. We misuse it and abuse it, just as we've done with many other gifts that God has given us. Good things in excess become bad. Food is something that we all need to survive. It's the fuel to provide energy for our bodies so that we can go about our daily lives. But for many, food becomes addictive or is difficult to eat in healthy ways because it is hard to say no to that chocolate cake or ice cream. Even if we have illnesses like diabetes or allergies or food sensitivities. I know I've spent my whole life trying to have the right kind of self-control with food so that I eat what is helpful for me and not what is harmful for me. And when I was 234 pounds before, I hated how I looked and how I felt, but I felt powerless to stop eating the way I was eating because I was raised that food was love and that food was expensive and you don't waste it. I've gained and lost hundreds of pounds over my life beginning in sixth grade. And it's only been in the last few years after struggling with autoimmune diseases that I've gotten a little better at self-control with what I feed myself because I don't want to lay in bed in pain all day. But in the early days of switching my diet around to avoid the things that cause me pain, I would still give in to temptation in a weak moment. That pastry or pasta looks so good. But I would end up sick for days, which kept me from being able to do other important things that I wanted to do. And for me, I had to ask God for lots and lots of help to practice self-control and begin thinking about the foods that made me sick as poisons or toxins. Why would I want to put poison in my body, even if it masquerades as a chocolate glazed donut? Everyone fights the battles of self-control on a regular basis. Sometimes in one area of our lives and sometimes in many areas at once, which makes it feel like it's just too overwhelming to even try to get our cussing or our drinking or our temper or our overeating or our smoking or our sex urges or our thoughts or any number of other things that could be listed here under control. God's word warns us about not having self-control from stories such as Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, David and Bathsheba, as well as in specific verses like Proverbs 25, 28, which says that one who lacks self-control is like a city breached without walls. 
In other words, you lack defenses to protect one's well-being. And there are many verses that speak to the importance of disciplined lives. Titus 2 gives instruction to men, women, and children to live godly, self-controlled lives. And in verses 11 to 13, it says this, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all, training us to renounce impiety and worldly passions, and in the present age to live lives that are self-controlled, upright, and godly, while we wait for the blessed hope and the manifestation of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And 2 Peter 1, 5 through 8 says, Make every effort to support your faith with excellence, and excellence with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with endurance, and endurance with godliness, and godliness with mutual affection, and mutual affection with love. For if these things are yours and are increasing among you, they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, let's aim to be fruitful, not unfruitful. And today's scripture passage from Philippians 4 helps us to explore the importance of gentleness and self-control in order to be a follower of Christ. Most failures to be Christ-like are connected to a lack of self-control. But most successes at being Christ-like are connected to the power of self-control. So if you have your Bible on your phone or Bible in front of you, you might want to open to Philippians 4. If you have it memorized, you can just do it from memory. And we're going to see what Paul is sharing from his prison cell to the church at Philippi. Now, he begins by telling these early disciples that they are beloved and that they need to stand firm in the Lord. And these two thoughts really do go together. We're beloved by God, which means that we can trust what God has done and is doing for us in order for us to become who we are meant to be. God wants us to be successful in becoming like Christ and wants us to do so in Christ's strength. We can stand firm in the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus and keep seeking to become more like Jesus, who is our firm foundation. Now, Paul then urges two women who have shared in the work of the gospel right alongside of him to please get along. He doesn't take sides in whatever is causing this fight, but he just encourages them to find a way to reconcile and be united in Christ. And he encourages those around the women to help out as well. Division in churches and communities prevents growth from happening, and it, it takes self-control to avoid and to heal divisive situations. He then tells the early followers to rejoice, and it was so important, he tells it to them again. So why say it twice? Because living in Christ and with Christ is supposed to be joyous. We've been set free, redeemed, loved back into the fullness of life by the extreme generosity of our Savior. And that should be a source of constant joy for us as we seek to become like Christ through the Holy Spirit working in us. We don't begrudgingly try to be like Christ. We rejoice in it. Rejoice in the Lord. And I love verse 5. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. We don't often think of gentleness as connected to Christian leaders. We think in terms of power and might. Pulpit pounding, Bible thumping, shouting out the warnings for not turning your life around to Jesus. But Paul says the time is near. The Lord is near. Let your gentleness be known. Be known by your gentleness to everyone. And being gentle to everyone takes a lot of self-control. Then we read, pray about everything, don't be anxious. Now, a little anxiousness can help us to be ready and alert for challenging situations. It's the whole fight or flight system that God built into us. But anxiety out of control causes harm to us and others. Prayer and thankfulness are biblical cures for anxiety. And amazingly, one of the ways that even non-Christian therapists help people with out of control anxiety is by encouraging them to start a thankfulness journal or keep a list of things that they're thankful for. 
Stay connected with God in prayer and focusing on all that you're thankful for can help you grow in self-control. And the peace of God that surpasses understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. What would our lives be like if our hearts and minds were so in tune with Jesus that our daily choices and behaviors were only ones that created peace in us? Peace with God and peace with others. Verses 8 and 9 are key to developing self-control in our lives. What we allow our minds to focus on influences our outward actions and choices. If we're supposed to be growing the fruit of the Spirit in our lives so that we can become like Christ, then we need to pay attention to Paul's advice here. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Think about good things. When bad thoughts come into your mind or temptations pull you in directions that you know aren't going to bring out your best for God's glory, then switch from stinking thinking to a true view. In the true view, pause and reflect on the truth that Jesus revealed through his life. How can you take this moment in time and do what will honor Christ? What do you need to stop reading or watching that's filling your mind with negative stuff so that you can start spending more time in God's word, filling it with blessings and joy and positives? And then verse 9 tells the believers to put into practice what they have learned, seen, and heard from their spiritual leaders. Don't just attend the religious meetings and call yourself a Christian. Practice being a follower of Jesus on a daily basis by learning from God's word, by listening to others share their Jesus discoveries, by observing how other disciples live out their faith, and by imitating Christ as you come to understand him through word and deed. And remember, practice makes perfect. Another help for trying to gain more self-control is to practice being content in the moment. If your goal is to become like Christ instead of to become popular or wealthy or famous, then it's easier to trust that God is with you, guiding you in each moment to make choices that help you achieve the ultimate goal of Christ-likeness. If you're never happy with what's happening in your life, then it becomes easier to give in to temptations and to take shortcuts to achieve what you feel you deserve instead of putting into practice things that will help you become who God is calling you to be. And we aren't to compare ourselves with one another. We're supposed to be comparing ourselves with Jesus and Jesus alone. It takes self-control to be content in the moment with what you have and who you are. and takes self-discipline and self-control to keep becoming who God intends for you to be as a faithful follower of Jesus. And verse 13 is one that many folks have memorized. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Abiding in Christ is the source of our strength and self-control that gives us the ability to do all the things we need to do in order to be like Christ in the world. What kind of fruit is your life revealing to others? And if it doesn't look fully like Jesus Christ, then you're not done developing the fruit of the Spirit in your life. As we prepare for communion, let's prepare our hearts for the real presence of Jesus that through the bread and the cup, the spirit of Christ might be in us so that we can grow in the fruit of the spirit in our lives and we can make a difference in the world as we become like Christ. Amen.